whenever you're ready, Tara. Okay, great. So thank you everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar on gender equity and squash. And we're gonna take a few minutes um, to go through the poll and a couple of slides. And again, I'd like to mention that this webinar is meant for the entire community and isn't really specific. So just to get into the poll, uh, just to get started. So we are gonna go through, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the presentation and Steph, if you wanna move to the next slide, it would be great. Uh, and we ask that you guys stay muted, but we are going to open up the mic to the audience at a couple of spots and you will be notified on this opportunity um, to come off and provide your input and your ideas. So we will be asking the audience for some information at times in the webinar, but in the meantime, if you can stay on mute, um, and I encourage you to connect. So on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a chat box. So there's a chat box in the top right. So I encourage you to connect, to engage in the discussion, to ask questions in the comment box. Uh, this webinar, as Jeff mentioned, is part of the professional development webinar, webinar series by Squash Canada. So if you are a coach, you may receive points for it. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tara Mullins, and I'm the female engagement and gender equity program lead for Squash Canada. And also moderating on this call are Karina Lynn, who's part of our Female Engagement Committee, and Stephanie Edmondson, who's board liaison. So you will be able to speak with them in the chat. Okay, so we're gonna move over to our poll. If you just give me one second, and I will get that quickly organized. And it just take a few seconds. Okay, so if you are on menti.com and if you just joined, if you can take a second and open menti.com and enter the code 945739, we are going to see, we're trying to find out who's with us today. So who's joined us, where are you from? So the first question we ask you um, to provide an answer to is what province or territory are you joining us from? So if we can take a minute and, uh, and let us know where you're joining us from, that would be great. Sorry, can you repeat the code? Nine four five seven three nine five. Also, it's in the chat. It's also in the chat, so you can likely click right on the link. And then also um, the code will be in there as well. Perfect, so lots of different representations so far. BC, Ontario, Northwest Territories, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Great. Thanks everyone. We'll go for another 15 seconds as we're getting some more people. Any questions there? Twenty. All right. So we have almost thirty people that answered. So another ten seconds, and then I'll move on to the next question. We only have. It won't take too long. So the next question is: How are you involved in squash? So we're looking to see um, what you do in in squash in the squash community. So are you a coach? Are you an executive? Director, are you part of the administ administration? Are you an official? So how are you involved? And we've also allowed for a couple of answers in case you overlap with two. So if you can let us know, that would be great. Perfect. So lots of different representation. Oh, that's great. Player, board member, coach, admin, athlete. Volunteer, can't do much without our volunteers. Great. Parent. So lots of different, lots of different representation, lots of different, um, lots of different vantage points, lots of different information that we can provide on this call in this webinar, both from our perspective and what we have to present to you guys, and then also to hear from you guys. So it'll be great to hear from everybody once we get to that point to understand what all the different perspectives are in our community. Okay, so moving on to our third question. 
Final question. What do you expect to get out of this webinar? So it's an opportunity to let us know what you're hoping to achieve by listening to what we have to present, what you're hoping to get, what you want to know about gender equity in squash and provide us some information that we can also take forward, take your ideas forward and move, and move into this project. And so if you can provide some information here that will help direct us going forward in terms of what we're bringing out to the community. Great. I want to get you in rep players. Awesome. Great. Information, goals, timelines. Specific action to follow through with. Learn how Squash Canada is approaching equity. Great. Better understanding of why women enjoy squash, some ideas, planning for girls and women only programs, specific actions. Grow women squash, engage women and girls. Great, thanks for that. How to make it more accessible for women to participate, information about getting, keeping women and girls in squash. Lots of great input there, thanks everyone. Great, thanks. All right, Steph, feel free when you want to switch the screen, you can go ahead. Perfect. So I can't, just give me one second. Great. So just to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing today, our agenda, we're going to be talking about what gender equity is and why it's important. The Squash Canada Female Engagement and Gender Equity Program. So those of you that wanted to know kind of what we're doing, we'll pull it up in there. Identified gaps in women's participation in squash in Canada, strategies and tactics to raise female engagement in all roles and all levels, and then what you can do now. So someone asked about action items, so we'll pull those in at the end of the webinar, and then we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. So the goal of the webinar is to raise awareness regarding gender equity in squash in the squash community and to provide information and tools so that everyone on this call can start to make a difference in your communities and overall in Canada. To give you a bit of a background, in 2018, the government in Canada set a target to achieve gender equality in, by 2035, making it clear that gender equity is a priority for all levels of sport. So if we wanna make a difference with gender equity in squash, everybody needs to play a part, whether you're an executive director, a touring pro, a teaching pro, a parent, a volunteer, an official, to move the needle more towards gender equity, a gender equity balance, it's going to take our community. It's going to take our entire village. So everyone needs to pay attention, needs to get involved, and needs to become aware and educated, and needs to work together to make that difference. So the female engagement and gender equity project can only do so much, but we do it together. And at the end of the presentation, as I mentioned, we'll be providing an action you can do now whether you're in a person of authority, a decision-making role, a non-decision-making role, or even a fan or a spectator. So to talk about what gender equity is, we've put up the definition here by Canadian Women in Sport. So Canadian Women in Sport is an organization that's been around for 40 years, and it strives to build a stronger, more equitable sports system for Canadian women and girls. It works with organizations, governments, leaders to build better sports gender equity. We like to use this, the definition on the screen is gender equity is the process of allocating resources fairly and addressing any imbalances in the benefits available to people of different genders. I also really like the vision which is on the next slide. So this visual, this particular one that is up on the screen now, shows the difference between equality and equity. So if you look at the top picture, only the woman fits the bike, everyone else doesn't. So equality is giving everyone the same tools and resources and the same starting line. So providing the same bike to everyone and asking them to get to their finish line. Whereas in the bottom picture, every single person has a different tool to get to the, to the, get to the finish line. So equity is ensuring fair access for all based on their needs and a focus on getting people to the finish line so that they can succeed. In other words, in contrast to equity, gender equality is the process of allocating resources, programs, and decision making so that all genders have the same access to resources, facilities, and access to the same programs. Which means that if we have a boys program, we have a girls program. So the principle of equal treatment tends to ignore the fact that people 
differ in their capacities, interests, needs, and experiences, whereas that bottom picture takes that into consideration. Um, so it might mean that we need to look at a bit of reframing and for us to see things a little bit differently in squash than we have done in the past, if we do want to make a difference in bridging more women and girls into our awesome sport. So how does this show up in squash? I'm going to give an example of a weekend tournament. And a tournament can be anything. It can be a club championships. It can be a provincial event. And there's lots of different types of weekend tournaments that I'm sure everybody on the call knows. And so tournament is a one size fits all solution, or is it an equitable, equitable approach? We provide a men's category, a women's category, we structure the times and ask people to play. And I'm not trying to come here and say that tournaments are bad or give you a change of structure or a new solution. What I'd like to do is engage the audience. So I'd like to ask your opinion on why you think women, why do what, what less women participate than men? Is the experience different for women than men? What are the barriers hindering participants from joining? Are the barriers different for women than they are for men? And what are some of the needs that women need in order to participate? So feel free to pull yourself off a mic if you have um, some ideas or input or provide information in the chat box to Karina and she can say it for you. We're looking to understand how might the needs of female and male players dif uh, be different and how could, some, how could we tweak the format so that more players engage more frequently? Feel free to jump off if you guys have any input on that. Well, I, I have in, input as a female player and board member. I just, uh, this is Rebecca from BC. Hi. Hi. I just know for me to play in a tournament, having three young children, there's a cost of childcare and committing to a whole weekend is huge. So I feel like that's always a deterrent and a suggestion I always make when we're running a tournament, maybe just doing it Friday night and Saturday. And that hasn't really been embraced in our area, but I think it's something that could be embraced. And I think you'd have a lot more people or at least more women join because the just dealing with childcare for three days or or whatever is a pretty expensive thing to add on to a tournament as well. It's interesting because that was one of the conversations that we had as well and that's a very valid point. And we also thought what if tournaments brought childcare into their entry fee so you were able to bring children to the tournament and they reminded as you played your matches so you don't have to worry about that. So that that was another solution we thought about as a team, but that's a really great point that tournament organizers, if they're looking to engage more women and girls, that's that's a barrier that they need to know about. And if we can try to bridge that barrier to bring more women and girls into the sport or into tournaments. Thank you. Anyone else have any input or ideas? Karina, is there anything on the chat that you can uh, let us know about? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, it was pretty much uh, what was, uh, uh, brought up here is access to child care can be a barrier yeah. and um, uh, one day tournaments have been successful in the GTA yeah Great. Uh, female specific programs events help with a welcoming committee community great yeah good comments great thanks everyone all right, I'll just wait another about 10 seconds to see if anybody else has any other inputs. If there are any women or females on the call that have um, know of their barrier, why they don't play, if you can speak up and let us know about that or put that in the chat, that would be great. So if you, if you do play squash and you don't play tournaments, why don't you play? Is it? Yeah. There's hey, we have another comment. Tara, uh, some women feel they may not be good enough or they are happy with the workout they get with their regular schedule since they might always get a good match in a tournament. Oh, okay. sorry. Not always get a good match in a tournament. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Giselle. Hey, Tara, this example is um, it's Steph Edmison here. Um, I'm recently picking up a new sport for me, which is tennis. And a big barrier for me was picking up the sport with friends. So I had some reservations doing it alone. Um, yeah. So I feel as though if people have a lot of their friends or know people in the tournament, they're more likely to sign up than if they're not. Um, so that could always be a barrier. Great. And so those, those two points, Giselle and Steph, talk about a little bit of the supporting environment 
the encouragement, and some of the things that I'll get into later in the webinar that we discovered um, are important to engage women and girls in squash. So I will talk about those points in a little bit. So thanks for, thank you very much for your input, everyone. Okay. So five more seconds, and then we'll move on to the next slide in case anybody has anything else to say. Okay. So. So thanks everyone for your ideas and input. Steph, I don't know, I can't see your slide. Give me one second. If you can move to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, in summary, um, and a recommended read, when in considering engaging women and girls in squash, we want to consider not just the physical benefits that come from participating, but also the social and psychological aspects. And so those were brought up a little bit in those examples that came through in terms of um, playing with friends and that supporting environment and the encouragement. Um, and when we say participating, we don't just mean playing, we mean engaging in all roles and all levels. So leadership roles, areas like volunteering, coaching, administration. And we also want to consider the needs, interests and experience of all genders and whatever you're trying to achieve. So whether it's forming a committee, a tournament, recruiting a pro, anything that you're trying to do, those are very important aspects to consider. So I encourage you to read. There's a document out there by Sport for Life called Actively Engaging Women and Girls, Addressing the Psychosocial Factors. If you can take a chance, if you can take some time and read that, you will dive a little bit more into this. And if you're a coach or if you're doing programming, this will give you some more input going forward of how you can engage more women and girls. And so moving to the next slide, Steph, thanks. And talk a little bit why gender equity is important. We're gonna do it in three phases. The first, we're gonna talk about it in general, then we'll talk about it in sports, and then we'll talk about it in our sport, in squash. So research constantly proves that organizations that embrace gender equity outperform those that do not. There's a lot of research out there that shows that diverse organization, organizations re reduce groupthink, they enhance decision-making, they boost company reputation, and a lot more. There's a lot of examples on this screen in terms of why it's important in general. And if we move on to sport, so when it comes to sport, we're just gonna wait for Steph to flip the slide. Great, thanks Steph. When it comes to sport, women are still underrepresented at all levels of sport. And some of the barriers that hinder women from participating are lack of role models, lack of media coverage, pay inequity, negative stereotyping, and these are just a few, there's a lot more, um, but we wanted to highlight mostly that women are still underrepresented in sport in general. And when it comes to squash and gender equity in squash, women represent a growth opportunity for our sport at all levels and in all roles. So our stats are 25% of Canadian coaches are female, 25% of Canadian players are female, and 22% of Canadian officials are female. And these stats come from our national participation survey, which we did at the end of 2019. It was a survey we gave out to all the provincial and territorial associations to provide input, input to this program of why there is, um, uh, why, oh, sorry, the, the information on the perceptions of female participation in squash. And what an interesting point on this slide is, is and the huge opportunity is that when mothers play sport, their children are far more likely to also play. So that it is an opportunity here that if we focus more on mothers and engaging mothers, there's a likelihood to have a ripple effect on engaging more of their children into squash. And it's a high percentage, it's a 71 percentage. So I encourage you to look at your initiatives and build recruiting mothers into your strategy. And that will actually, if you're able to build that in, you might, you'll be able to build a, that ripple effect of getting more girls into squash or more children into squash as well. Okay. so. The Female Engagement and Gender Equity Project is trying to create awareness in Canada, in the Canadian squash community, regarding why gender equity is important. The infographic that you see on the screen was shared through communication channels. And if you haven't seen it, please comment in the chat box with Karina and highlight the channels that you use so that we can make sure that our information is getting out to the broader community. We also want to point out that we are using the hashtag SheCanSquash. So can has two Two meanings here. She's can as an able and she can as in Canada. And so if you start, uh, if you can start using this ha hashtag to showcase and highlight women in squash, it'll help to create re awareness and that would be fantastic. 
All right, so, so before we move on to our female engagement program, we wanted to highlight current achievements and to say that Squash Canada is heading in the right direction, but we still have work to do and we recognize that. So some of the current achievements we have so far, we do have leadership support. So we've launched the female engagement and gender equity program and we've established the female and gender equity committee and we also established a diversity and inclusion task force. And when I say we, I mean Squash Canada. Provincial and territorial associations, I want to thank you for supporting our communications and participating in our national gender participation survey. All provinces answered it, so thank you for that. And also to let everybody know on this call that there were four female engagement committees across Canada in three different provinces. BC has one, Alberta has two, and Ontario has one, and then we have ours in Squash Canada. If you have one and we haven't highlighted it, if you can let Karina know so that we can engage with you as well, that would be great. Those are the ones that we've researched and know about, but we may have missed something. So if we did, I apologize, but please let us know. Also want to highlight that we have diversity in the boardroom. We have 50-50 male to female ratio in Squash Canada board representation, which is huge. It's bigger than most of the stats that are out there. So that's a positive for us. And we are showcasing women's successes in communications, not just on a national level, but I've also seen it in the provincial level. So thank you for everyone who's creating that content. And if you also showcase women in your communications um, in, the, in your clubs and in other publications, because I know there's some people on this call that have their own publications, thank you for that, because that is bringing awareness um, and creating education in the community. So to talk a little bit about our female engagement and gender equity program, it is current partially funded by the government of Canada, and we've also established a program partner. So our program partner is Squash Republic. And I want to just let you know that we are starting off with a focus on women and girls, but we do recognize that gender equity means all genders, but we did have to start somewhere. So we will be moving forward to all genders once we can kind of get a grasp on everything that we're doing. So to talk a little bit more about the project, Steph, if you want to move to the next slide, it'd be great. The project launched, launched in October 2019 to increase the participation of women in squash at all levels and in all roles. And we are looking at participation rates. We're looking at barriers to participation. We're looking at recruitment and retention strategies. And I'd like to give a shout out to the Female Engagement Committee that are volunteers across Canada that support and work on this project. So Rob Pacey from BC, Karina Lynn from BC, Caroline DeVry from Alberta, Susie King in Alberta, Liz McBeth in Ontario, Rachel Bordron in Ontario, Renee Blanchard in New Brunswick, and Steph Edmondson, who's on our board. All right. So to tell you a little bit about what we've done year one, so we've provided over $14,000 to the community via our Women in Squash Encouragement Fund. We've surveyed to help understand what's happening in the market. And in the winter, we will be added, we will be distributing another survey to the community to get the input and information from the entire community as, as opposed to just the provincial and territorial associations. So we've started off with one and then we're gonna expand to hear what you guys have to say and what everyone is looking for. So please look out for that survey coming up in the winter. We've developed a plan, we're implementing the plan. We've tested activities. Unfortunately, three got rescheduled due to COVID-19. We've developed a mentoring program. So we're trying to ignite connections across the country. And we currently just launched our informal mentoring program. We have 19 mentors in all different aspects of squash. And we're currently recruiting for mentees. So if you are interested in being part of the program, or if you know someone in your community that could benefit from a mentor, uh, please, reach out to mentoring at squash.ca. I forgot to put that email up there. So Karina, if you could put that in the um, chat box, that would be great. So mentoring at squash.ca. And the other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to create structure and sustainment, sustaining, sorry, a structure to sustain the program, which we forward the female engagement committee and the partnership. Okay, so from our national participation survey, these are some of the gaps that we found in women's participation in squash. And interesting finds, we've talked about the women coaches and the, the percentage of coaches. The largest female player market is between the ages of 20 and 50. And the largest participation gaps are open A and E levels. So we have an opportunity to engage E level, beginner and grassroots, as well as open and A. We also found there's a lack of female adult training opportunities and the most common perceived barriers to engagement are lack of coaching role models 
lack of all female programs and lack of support and encouragement, which is very interesting because that came up earlier on slide eight or slide nine when we opened the mic. So those points are perceived barriers to squash. So what we did is in our program is we designed pilots specifically trying to fill those gaps. And we created all female environments and pilots in officiating, coaching, participation. And what's not on the screen is a junior clinic that we had organized, an all female clinic in Quebec that canceled due to COVID. So we didn't get to finish that, po that poster. And what I also wanted to point out from this particular slide is that a personal approach to bridge women into squash is, sorry, a personal approach is key to bridging women into squash. Um, and so if there are low numbers, in our participation rates, I encourage you to reach out to people personally and not just do mass emails because there's a higher success rate of bringing women into any, any aspect of squash through a personal ask. And it's actually bigger than we think. Oh, just trying to flip one second, sorry guys. Okay, so through our survey, we also identified eight gender equity opportunity areas. We've talked about a few of them already, um, but I just want to highlight a couple before we move on to the next section of the presentation. So in terms of governance, only 31% of our PTAs have a policy that addresses, addresses inclusion of female participants and leaders. Um, there's also an opportunity in communications. So imagery, inclusive language we'll get into, but there's opportunity there to actually engage more women and more girls into the sport through our promotions. And I'll show you, I'll explain how we can do that and supporting environments. So again, that was brought up on our open discussion in terms of what we can do to, to bring more women into squash. Um, the uh, next four areas of opportunity that we discovered are male allies and the need for training, education, and funding. So in our program, we tried to take a stab at those as well, and we created our Women in Squash Encouragement Fund. And we also found through our fund that the community is looking for funding to develop women's program because we were very successful in our application process. And our fund is meant to bridge that, op bridge that gap and to create that opportunity. I also want to talk about uh, showcasing females in squash. So when we talk about showcasing our community, we're not just talking about high performance, but highlighting all levels and all roles as people need to see themselves to join and engage. So from our findings and our analysis, we developed our strategic plan. And again, this particular infographic was shared through our communication channels. And if you actually haven't received it, please let us know what your channels are so we can make sure we're hitting the broader community. And our plan that we're working through right now and we're implementing includes both short and long-term activities to create awareness, to build skill set, and to increase knowledge as well as to develop practices and policies, increasing the likelihood of success and sustainability. So this webinar links into that second pillar, which is community engagement. The numbers are arbitrary. It's just to let you know that we have five different pillars and all the gaps and opportunities that I've explained in the, in the previous slides fall under these pillars. So we've looped everything together and we've moved forward to try to make a difference in gender equity and squash with this particular strategy. If you wanna read more about the strategy, it's something, I believe it's about a 14, 15 page document. So the website's up on the bottom of the screen there and you can, um, find the infographic and then click on the infographic and it'll pull up our report so you guys can know what we're doing and where we're heading. So if we move on to uh, tactic, tactics and strategies, we're gonna talk in a minute about five different tact tactics and strategies that will increase female engagement in all roles and all levels. And then we'll get into what you guys can do today. So our tactics that we're gonna talk about are engagement model, inclusive language, inclusive imagery, gender parity on boards and committees, and role models and allyship. But before we get to the, that particular area, I'd like to open up the mic again. And I'd like to discuss with the group and loop back to our weekend tournament example. So if you can provide your input and come off mic whenever you want or provide comments in the chat on if you use different tactics to get women engaged, women and girls engaged into tournaments and what those tactics might be. What have you been successful at bringing women and girls into your tournament, your weekend tournament. So if there's any tournament organizers out there that can provide input on what you've done, specific asks or different actions to bring more people in, that would be great. Anybody have any ideas? No tournament organizers out there? Kara, I'll jump in. This is Lindsay from Ontario. Sure. Um, I was just 
starting to write my answer in the chat box. But um, I we noticed that once the draw, the entry date has passed, um, to complete draws, we have reached out specifically to certain people, uh, like just just like um, personally touch base with people and ask them what their schedule conflicts were, just so that they could enter into the uh, to the tournament. So just scheduling around people's uh, conflicts. Great. That's great. Anybody else have any um, strategies they've used to bring more people into weekend tournaments? Hey, Tara, the chat's um, pretty active, so maybe you can um, highlight some of the things in the chat right now. Sure. Thanks. I had that hidden. Ladies yeah. only tournaments, which is great. Exactly. So the all inclusive environment all female environment, I mean, does actually bridge more women and girls into the sport. Team tournaments creates tons of support athletically and socially. So social environment, again, supporting environment. Um, squash week in BC, Women's Squash Week, again, another program tailored for all female, all female environment. Uh, what did Liz write? Inclusive language, imagery, pre-fill draws with personal asks so that you're actually taking scheduling into account. And that was another barrier which I didn't mention. So that's a good point, Liz, is competing priorities was a barrier for women to play in um, in events and, and programs because they they had a hard time juggling their schedules. So if you are trying to engage more women and girls, if you can help out by providing flexible schedule or times that they need then and i know it might be a little bit more of a admin side of things to do but it will increase the likelihood of more women and girls playing or women playing because of their competing priorities did i miss any karina have you been reading them as well i'm just looking at them now <clears throat> yeah i'm uh, there as well. uh girls only junior lessons um showing females loving the sport and tournament posters that's a good point yeah, inclusive imagery. Mother and daughter program. program. Yeah. There's good comments on the poster you showed there, um, Tara, and yeah. suggestions to uh, put that out on the social media channels. Which one? Sorry, I missed that point. The, the poster that you showed in uh, the previous slide, there was a good comment on that, that it's very uh, visual. Great. So we did put those out in communication channels. Any of the posters that you see that I've popped up on the screens, any of the infographics, they've all been communicated through the Squash Canada communi communication channels and then hopefully the provincial and territorial communication channels. So if you haven't received it, then please let us know because then we have a gap there and we need to actually know what that gap is so we can reach out to make sure that that actually gets filled for our next communications. So either if you're comfortable writing in, in the chat, that would be great. If not, you can email me personally. My, my email is my name, tara.mullins at squash.ca. And then we can start to try to bridge those gaps because we do want to provide the information to the community. And we want to also give people the opportunity to join our programs and to join our initiatives. So please do let us know. We are asking for that information. Hey, Tara, um, I see we've got Women's Squash Week in BC in the comments here. I yeah. would love to hear about how that week unfolds and what the scheduling is like in that event. Sure. Is there someone in particular that I'm just gonna scroll through the chats and see who wrote that? Mm. Yeah, uh, that was me, Tara Shelley in BC. Yes, hey Shelley. Uh, the main point on Women's Squash Week to get entry level women into tournaments was personal contact. So, um, Bev Lawton did an awesome job of keeping the women engaged. So Women's Squash Week is normally a one-week event. We have a lot of sirens here. It's okay. We can still hear you. <laughs> it's a one-week event where we um, in, get, get women from the community that haven't played squash before onto the squash court. And then the most successful programs were the ones where we kept those women coming back for five or six weeks and at the same time encouraged them to play in tournaments at entry levels. So in groups, they um, were new to squash and the majority of them remained in squash yeah. because they had that um, continuous play. 
Great. Great. So a lot of a similar terminology that we've been talking, I've been chatting about since the beginning of the presentation and that we've heard from other people participating on this call is that personal ask, encouragement, support. Um, so very similar across the country in terms of what we need to, to kind of bridge more women into the sport. Imagery, inclusive language. Any other input from the audience or from the participants? You're not the audience, sorry. Hits and Knits Day. Oh, that's interesting. Lisa wrote about a Hits and Knits Day, about a combination of squash and craft. Oh, great. So combining squash with other activities as well. That's a great idea. I remember from my experience, um, I was able to bridge a lot more women into events um, through personal asks. So I would actually just walk through other areas of the club environment and ask people who've never played to come out and try. So that was huge in bringing those grassroots people into programming. Um, I asked, I always did bring a friend event. So bring a friend events would bring someone in that's new and would grow programming that way. All women's programming, all women's league, all women's clinics, all women tournaments. Those were all big in kind of bringing in that culture of a sense of belonging and for people to participate. So those were huge. We don't have any more comments. Um, we have one more. It says uh, post-event testimonials. This is another good one. Great. Yeah, Rec recognition. That's great. That's a that's a big point as well. Yeah. So the Women's Squash Week in BC engaged all the clubs across BC, enabling new people to drop in and to meet and greet and learn. So that's great. Thanks for all that input. All right. So moving on to uh, the tactics and strategies that we're going to discuss with you guys, um, and some of them, it'll probably just overlap in terms of everything that we've, we've talked about. So the first one we wanted to talk about was an engagement model. And this engagement model is about engagement needs. So what people generally need in order to self-select into an activity and then keep at it. So for boys, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, and you look on the boys' side, for boy participants, performance enhances their social position for more, most boys, many boys. For girls, social acceptance enhances performance. So if you look, the model is reversed for boys and girls. So if boys, di boys differ, boys and girls differ in their needs, interests, and for girls, it ties into that supporting environment, feeling comfortable, accepted, and once those are met, then it will lead to their effort, performance, and positive experience. So it's opposite. So even though this model is labeled for coaching, it can be used to understand how to engage women in, in all roles and all levels. And I encourage you to use this model and to look at it when you're trying to engage more women and girls and look at your approach. Are you doing it exactly the same way for boys and girls? Are you doing it exactly the same way for men and women? Because if you are, you likely won't get the same results. And if you are trying to engage more women and more girls, that supportive environment, that feeling of belonging and um, social acceptance is what's going to bring them more into um, continue sustain, sustaining in, into, your, into squash. The other point I wanted to do before moving on is talk about coaches. So for coaches, by upholding a standard of how you communicate and act with your participants, as well as how the participants act with each other, which is very, very important. So how do your participants act amongst your group or your event? you can instill a strong sense of social belonging, and that's super important. And also, quality in coaching is important for all athletes from beginner to high performance. So if, you're co if you're the coach or the program turns an athlete off or doesn't offer the value to stay in the sport, then we will continue to have dropouts, and the beginners, beginners will never reach high performance levels. This is a very interesting and straightforward model, and I encourage you to use it and implement it going forward. So if you want to print screen it or reach out to us. And I, oh, actually, I believe Jeff will be sharing the slides. So I encourage you to use this model when you are creating your next programs or reach out to us and ask questions if you need any help or input. So if we move on to our second strategy and ta or tactic, it's inclusive language. So inclusive language includes people rather than excludes people. And choosing ungendered language is always better. So if we look at the examples on the right, the first one is actually one of my, is my favorite. It's come on guys. And I like it because every time I'm at the courts, I hear it all the time. 
And when I was coaching with some peers, I always hear, let's go guys, come on guys. And guys is gendered language that may imply that men are the preferred gender. So I encourage you, I think we should choose our, not I think we should choose our words carefully and choice of words is very important. So think about what your words mean and what kind of image your words create with others. And you might even say something that you don't even know affected a participant and this might discourage them from joining and you likely will never know. So if you are, sorry, in my, if you're using inclusive language, it will help ensure that all of your members and participants feel respected. So that's the second point on the slide. And uh, in helping to sustain engagement rather than discouraging someone from staying in squash. And I also like that last point on the slide, which is don't forget to thank your mom and dad to change to don't don't forget to thank whoever brought you here because it includes all family structures. And again, um, I encourage you to listen to yourself when talking and see if you're using inclusive or exclu exclusive language because we all have an implicit bias that affects the words we use and using inclusive language is a conscious effort to communicate. So I do encourage you to listen to what you're saying and see if you can catch yourself sometimes using, a, a not, using um, an exclusive term versus an inclusive term. And there's tons of research on the internet about this. So um, if you can start to uh, bridge that into your communications, both when you're doing verbal clinics or at the courts and also in your communications and your promotional material. I think it'll actually go a long way. It's very, it's, it's an important point. Uh, the next tactic is inclusive imagery. So this, the point here is that people have to see themselves in order to join and engage. So if you're looking to target a specific target market in squash, provide that imagery, imagery in what you are trying to do. So for players to, uh, for player participation, Inclusive language and inclusive Im imagery is an, uh, an inclusive image approach, as well as tailored programs are what is needed. So going forward, um, I suggest that you, or I recommend that you suggest your, you assess your images, your image choices, your, your, your language and communications, and assess the impact before choosing it. And then another good point that was brought up on a recent call that I was um, on with someone is post-event pictures. Often after our tournaments and events, we highlight and showcase results, the winners, winners in each category, but we don't necessarily showcase the broad participation and celebrate everybody who's actually participated in that particular program. And by including everyone and thanking everyone for participating, it will actually create that inclusive environment and will give people a sense to want to continue and increase the sustainment of bringing them back into our program. So if you are a tournament organizer, if you can, walk away with that point, that would be great. So highlight the winners, which is great, but also highlight everybody else who's participated in the event so that we increase the likelihood of them participating again. So our next strategy is gender balance boards and committees. So this, as I've already mentioned earlier in the presentation, that more diverse committees means greater range of skills, experience, and strategies, which creates greater opportunity for growth. So I encourage you to look at your committees look at your boards and see if there's an opportunity to create more gender parity going forward. And some of the benefits that will help create that mentioned earlier are group reduces group think, enhances decision-making, it's critical for innovation and maximizes talent and productivity. So we all, all the provinces and even Squash Canada have boards and committees and some associations do. So going forward, consider that, consider skill set, consider bringing people in that you need to fill different skills for your committees and consider creating more of a gender balanced in order to get um, a more diverse thinking process and all the other benefits that come with it. And our next strategy is role, model, role models and allyship. So women and girls need allies to support and champion them in their needs and to champion them and their needs. It's important to recognize that different individuals hold different levels of power in any given context. So those who have a higher level of power or influence have the potential to ensure that those with less power are being treated equitably and anyone can act as an ally. So if you do recognize that you are that person and you have a little bit more power, it's important for you to take initiative. As for role models, identify people and talk about them in your community. Create opportunities for participants to envision themselves getting to the next level. Encourage your participants to support less experience, experienced players. 
or even ask alumni to come and support any of the programs that you're doing. And remember, as we've talked about just recently, and people brought up when we opened up the mic, that a personal ask for recruiting is crucial for women. Get into the Q&A, which we're almost there. And I thank you for your time and for staying on the line with us today. We're gonna to talk about actions you can do. And that was something someone brought up in terms of what you wanna get out of today's webinar. And we broke the action into three categories, decision-making roles, those that are governing across the country for squash, decision-making roles that are not as governing, and then also non-decision-making roles. And they're all mutually exclusive in terms of tactics. So if you feel one example resonates more, then take that and run with it. But if you are um, a Provincial Territorial Association, Board of Directors, Squash Canada, these are some of the items. We've got five different action items up here that you can do and walk away with today. So make strategic, make um, the level of female engagement in squash part of your strategic planning. Train and certify women coaches and officials and make sure you provide those all female environments. Communicate opportunities. Don't, don't expect, don't assume that people are actually looking for the information. Bring it to them and, and, and show them what's available. Analyze your recruiting practices and see support hiring and the selection of women coaches and officials. Um, ensure more of a woman uh, balance of women and men on committees and prioritize diversity and then ensure you're using those diverse images of women and girls inclusive language assess your promotional materials assess the impact before you send it out and then showcase women in squash in all levels and all roles if you are if we move to the next slide step thanks if you're a teaching pro if you're a coach if you're a club owner an associate president or on a committee invite women to the conversation, listen to what they have to say, ask for their experiences, ask for their expertise when you're developing programs and services. And if you are offering a program, analyze the options and participation rates and identify different needs, different barriers and develop solutions to reduce those barriers. Again, you can also assess your promotional material, make sure you're using inclusive images, inclusive language, and make sure you're showcasing what you're trying to bring uh, what you're trying to attract into your program or your event. Celebrate the whole community of women squash players in all levels and all roles. So not just those high performance players, not just the winners, but the entire community. And then also ignite a gender equity committee. So we've highlighted those in the area or in Canada that we've, we've identified, but if there isn't something in your area, then ignite one and start to bring that conversation to the table. And what you can do now if you're a touring squash professional or a recreational player or volunteer, is speak up, speak up and provide information, get involved, join a committee, you can mentor, and it doesn't mean joining our mentoring program, you're more than welcome to join our program, which would be fabulous, but you can mentor someone in your club, you can play with someone. I remember when I was starting off in squash, there was a woman at my, at my club who played with me all the time and she was so much better than me, but she played with me weekly. And that was a great mentorship that I had to actually get better in squash. You can nominate women leaders and then you can build connections. So facilitate introductions in your area or in your community. Facilitate, introduce mem uh, women to members of your network and help them connect. Help create those, that supporting environment. Help make them feel, get that sense of belonging so that they know who else, know other people within the community. And then on the last slide before we open for the Q&A is I encourage everyone to learn more. So including myself, so know the facts, about the barriers that women and girls encounter, know their experiences, participants and leaders and educate more. So here's where you've already started. You're here today participating with us. So thank you very much. And thank you for listening um, today or even on the recording. And Karina will be adding in the chat box, the links of the other recommendations that we have on the slide. So we've got e-modules, e we've got a tool and we have our resources. Um, so she'll put those links on the slide. We encourage you to look at the Canadian Women in Sport Gender Equity Lens. So that is usually a $25 per person module, and we're offering it today for complimentary for 30 people. So if you're interested in watching that module, please write your name in the chat box. And for the first 30 people, we'll, we'll provide that for free. We encourage you to do the Safe Sport Training Module and the Keeping Girls in Sport by Jumpstart. Gender equity in squash, oh, sorry, not gender equity. Uh, Canadian Women in Sport also has a gender equity lens for, for decision-making. That'll have a link in the chat. That's a really interesting tool if you're actually kind of trying to make a decision, including both, both male and female. 
to kind of raise your raise the level and go through a framework to make sure that you're considering all the aspects of women and girls. And then the last two documents that we've talked about, actively engaging women and girls and addressing their so psychosocial factors, and then our strategic plan. So we will now open up um, the floor for questions. If anybody has any questions or comments, um, please feel free to, um, to, to chirp in and to come off mic and to ask your questions. And thank you very much for your time. Any questions in the chat box? Uh, we've got um, lots of responses of interest for the uh, e-module. Great. Great. And anyone have any questions on what we've done here today or any other input or comments? Hey, Tara, Steph here. Yeah. Um, do we have any, maybe we could have, maybe this is a brainstorming ac exercise or maybe you have the answer, but are there any um, uh, ideas for engaging women in a time of COVID when we're not, we don't necessarily have access to courts? Good question. Um, we're trying to create some um, online modules, online virtual experiences. So some of the things that we have coming through the pipeline um, are some online officiating, all, all female officiating uh, courses. So look out for that. We're trying to engage and that will be across Canada. So we're trying to engage that. Uh, all female coaching, also trying to engage some online modules for that. So people across Canada can connect and engage and learn. Uh, our mentoring program is also virtual. So we're trying to connect that way. Um, in terms of in-club activities right now, that's just all about, that's mostly just the club and the club environment and the squash pro. So I'm not 100% up to date what each each location is doing. But uh, in terms of this project, we are trying to ignite some some online options for for everyone. And then the idea with those concepts and the ones that we did in March is to create the pilot, provide the information to the community, and then provide the pilot to the provinces and the clubs so they can actually repeat them. So we were getting to that point before COVID hit. And so we kind of got stalled because three of our pilots couldn't run. And so now that we're revamping them to try to get pilots to go online and package those up so those can be trickled down into the provinces and to the clubs. Um, we got a, a couple comments here, Tara, in the chat. Uh, one a question is, I wonder sometimes if we do enough to solicit why females stop coming out or why they don't re-enroll and engage is one question. Yeah, in terms of, I wonder why sometimes if if we do enough to solicit why females stop coming out. Yeah, uh, feedback forms are great for that. Anonymous feedback forms to understand what might have tipped someone out. And some of the stuff that I talked about that we might do that we won't even know that we're doing is that inclusive language. So someone might say something that tips someone out and then you'll never know why they tipped out. So again, try to be conscious of what you're saying and try to use inclusive language in order to decrease the likelihood of someone dropping out and increase sustainment. And it could also be some of the it could also be the the imagery which we talked about. There's a lot of different aspects. We've only provided five tactics today, but as we go through the project, we'll be able to help the community out more. Um, but really great point, Spider. Uh, Tara, just to run on that note, um, it might be an idea if we send out um, a quick link after this presentation to everybody that attended to give feedback, even just to this webinar. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Here, I just have a question. Um, I find that uh, often uh, there's like a problem at the top of female draws where as soon as uh, a female player gets, and I put air quotes around this, good enough, they kind of move into the male draws. And I don't know, how do we sort of stop that problem of like starting to weaken the female pool? I don't know how to address that. You think it's because there's just not enough women at that level that play in your area? And so they have to move to the men? It's possible that that's, that's a part of the issue, but it just, it still creates like a, almost like a hierarchy, like the male draws are better, you know, quote unquote, better than the female draws. And as soon as they're, you know, uh, at a competent level, they, they move off into it. And then um, the, the culture and the, the community of the female sort of side of the sport gets, 
um, watered down, I guess. And it just, yeah, I'm just not sure how do we sort of stop it seeming like the male draws are like the thing to strive for. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit like, and it's not, you're probably not the only area that has that. I know a lot of women that also play in the men's league and the men's draw, but they're looking at, like one of the gaps we did find is that we are lacking in that open A and B training environment. So it could also be just that the, the chopping block, we don't have enough players and the, the pool of players was bigger and there was more options for people to play against, then that actually might help bridge that. Um, I, like it's, it's a really good question. I don't know if I have the exact answer for that. It is something that hopefully as we move through this project and are able to pilot different things and create a different environment that, um, that we'll be able to kind of uh, take a stab at those as well. Um, but I suspect it's someone looking to get stronger, stronger matches and stronger play. So it would be about creating that environment in the women's category. To make so sure Tara, a strategy I deployed, I guess, when I was playing um, in more of my competitive days, yeah, because uh, I don't think the option to play in the men's categories was available to me at the time, but I was looking for uh, more challenging matches in some of the tournaments. And I wouldn't necessarily broadband or advertise it, but my coach would alter my game. So he would eliminate certain shots that I could hit in matches to make it more challenging for myself. Um, so that the matches, I would still be playing the matches against these females, but perhaps I was not allowed to hit any short shots or uh, they would actually cater it to, to me specifically. And that would be on the onus of the player though, right? The, the woman, the strong female player playing in the pool that her, that she perceives is not strong enough to alter her game. So she makes it more competitive, right? Is that what yeah. you think? Yeah. And I'm just also just making the point that if the tournament isn't, equitable for the female, the coach can step in and, and brainstorm some ways that you can make it equitable for you as well. So Tara, and I grew up in Northern BC or Central BC, and uh, I think you kind of nailed the <laughs> nail on the head there that it was a numbers thing, um, that as you got to a certain level, a lot of people ended up playing in what they called the men's draws. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm in the Kootenays in British Columbia as well, and, and that's still a concern. We have a lot of women actually playing at more of the beginner levels, but as they're getting stronger, there isn't um, a really core group of women playing at that same level. So we have started to, you know, not label the men's and women's. They're labeled as the sponsor division. So if you're a D player, women or men, you're in the D. And it's like might be, uh, you know, the source is D and it's not like men's D so that it's kind of, um, open to anybody at that level, but then we do still have the women's draws happening as well. So I'm not sure if that really helps, but there is myself and a few other women that are playing basically against men in every single tournament. And that's the way it's been since I was 10 years old. And uh, they're really trying to work at not calling them men's divisions or women's divisions. They're just calling them as per the level of play to try yeah. to get away from um, it, that stigma of it being only a men's division. Interesting. But on the on the opposite side of that, the ladies' divisions are called ladies, so um, you mm -hmm. kind of have a choice of playing in the A division or the ladies only kind of divisions. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thanks for that comment as well. And one of the things that we were wondering as a team in this project was the gaps for open A and E levels, and the attrition for juniors. Uh, started at 10, but then there was a high attrition rate at 16, which is very similar to other sports that are out there. But if we think of open A and the E level, and we're able to get, we were questioning if we're able to get more people in E and then create that sustainability and programming and supporting environment to bring them all the way up to the open level. And so when we get to the A and the open level, have those programs available for training and development catered to that specific level across the country, will we be able to increase the number of people that compete in that level as well so if we're able to if we're able to fill those gaps if we're able to provide that environment which tends to drop off at c we have a lot in the c and d level if we're able to bridge that we might be able to increase the sustainability and grow that market or grow that that player segment across the country so that woman may or may not have to go into the men's category or choose to go into the men's category, but that's a gap. And um, it's one of the things that we're looking at as well. 
Um, it's Lindsay here from Ontario. I, I just wanted to leave off with, this is A, a very exciting presentation, so thank you. Um, but B, something that we could do in the meantime is piggybacking on the Women's Squash Week idea. I wonder if um, across Canada we could do something similar to that um, in January, um, where sort of we all get together and build a campaign around it. So um, it can be totally virtual. Sam is talking here in the chat about doing online workouts. It could be just showcasing some of our past players, uh, yeah. basically just like drumming up a lot of uh, female squash interest, maybe at a time when everyone can do it um, as a country. Great. Great. Thanks for that. It's good. We could take that away too and look at creating some sort of online online forum for the community in a campaign. Great idea. Thank you. And actually to add to that, so Jeff here uh, just mentioned that there is the Women's Squash Week for U.S. Squash, but I think that's in September um, of every year. I, I could be wrong, but I think that's at the beginning of the squash season, but just something to do virtually right now would be um, maybe in January or February. Okay, great. Thanks, Lindsay. We have a good suggestion in uh, the chat, Tara, of, um, you know, running squash specific or specific women online workouts, um, I guess, especially during our remoteness, supporting something weekly. Um, you know, whether the suggestion was uh, Squash Canada, uh, you know, uh, provide some sort of participation with um, online weekly workouts to encourage uh, keep women enrolled or I, think I think I think Sam Cornett's volunteered to run them so we'll just <laughs> yes. as in a physical workout in terms of actually going through some sort of online online class okay interesting oh Sam wrote yeah okay that is interesting We'd have to assume that um, everybody has the space for that. But yeah, that's an interesting point. Oh, so Jeffrey uh, commented here, um, he has Hannah Blatt booked to do a Coach PD webinar in January. Registration details to come in the next couple of weeks. Okay. What's the topic, Jeff? Hannah is going to be speaking to uh, marketing yourself uh, using social media and uh, tailoring that to the the workouts and the the healthy recipes and things like that that she's been promoting since uh since covid started so it's kind of a twofold presentation but uh, yes she's got some great content great well that's good to know that's great for sure and then what did david anyone hear of rachel bakovec yankees batting coach have not david are you open to telling us a little bit about that Did he disappear? Maybe. He may be typing. I don't his mic. I don't know his mic might not be on. No, oh, maybe. Maybe for sure. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Thank oh, yeah. You. He said uh, the first uh, ever female pro coach. I did see something about that online. Very cool. Yeah, and if you guys have any other ideas or interests that. Um, that you want to share with us, please let us know. We're very happy to take the input from the uh, the community for sure. And if we don't have any other questions, Jeff, did you want to um, talk about what's coming up? Uh, yeah, just a, a friendly reminder for the coaches and, and anyone on the webinar today that would like to attend. Our next Coach PD webinar is uh, October 20th, being put on by Glenn Mulcahy from Paradigm Sports. Uh, his topic is don't be a kid's last coach. So it is a very good topic uh, for those of you, especially starting out. And even those of you who have been coaching for, you know, 15, 20, 30 years uh, to see a different side of coaching. And then after that, uh, our uh, Sam Cornett will be doing a, a topic on how to train to be a national athlete, which is, I think, a good, uh, a good webinar for you coaches to see the other side of the coin and uh, ways you might be able to implement that with your top athletes. Uh, further then into November, we have Pat Hartunian doing mental uh, mental strength. And then in December, we have Esme Gillick, 
from uh, England doing a presentation on emotional intelligence and its implications with coaching. So we've got four great topics coming up before we get into January with topics including Hannah Blatt as well as school squash and other topics to come. Great, thanks. Okay, well, I will stay on the line for another five to 10 minutes that we hit that 115 mark, but that was, if you have any other questions, please feel free to stay. I will be here and thank you everyone for joining in for your input. Jeff will be providing the slides to the participants, so look out for his email. And if you have any questions, comments, or wanna join the mentoring program in any capacity, please let us know. And you can email me, uh, it's my name, tara.mullins at squash.ca or mentoring at squash.ca. And a big thank you to Steph and Karina for supporting this webinar today and for everyone for coming. So thanks so much. Thanks, Tara. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone.